Good morning, church. My name's Steve Ginoble. I'm the director of family ministries at uh, First Baptist Simpsonville. I uh, just uh, wanted to introduce myself because I don't get a chance to come out here as much as I'd like. You know what I, I have seen? I have seen what God is doing, though, through the numbers. And I've been so excited about the opportunity to get the chance to come out and be with you guys. And, you know, we're in a, uh, a series about uh, Galatians and freedom. And the title of our message this morning is Good News in a Bad Day. Does that not sound like this week? Another school shooting. I felt like this morning as we began that we should pray um, for Santa Fe and all the families affected. I also, as Larry mentioned, I just wanted to pray for Dallas and his family as they transition uh, to serve you guys. So let's, uh, let's just spend some time praying as we begin this morning. Thank you, Father, that you are so, so good to us. And even in the midst of awful, difficult, terrible circumstances that you walk with us. And so I pray specifically for those families affected in Texas and people that all across our country that are affected by what happened this week. I thank you for the good news that we're going to talk about this morning. The good news that can uh, give comfort and strength in the midst of this difficult time. I pray, Father, for Dallas and his family. Lord, I thank you for putting us together, and we look forward to the opportunity for him to come and to serve alongside us here. Lord, I pray that you just make this transition smooth for him. Father, I thank you for what you're doing um, in this place, and I believe with all of my heart that the best days are still to come. So Lord, I just pray, Father, you take um, these next few moments uh, you move me out of the way, and Father, you speak to your people. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So this, we continue our study in Galatians, Galatians chapter 1. If you want to turn with me, uh, we will pick up really in the middle of the chapter, beginning in verse 11. Um, just, again, our series is about freedom, and that freedom that we have in Christ, and we'll be uh, looking at good news in a bad day, three reasons the gospel is the good news. And so we'll go through those quickly this morning. They were laughing earlier. Um, some of our speakers are, are, are much more long-winded. I would not be one of them. So I, I, I give you back some of the time that they steal from you, okay? <laughs> Just kidding. Galatians chapter 1, beginning with verse 11. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preach is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard my previous way of life in Judaism and how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many a uh, of my own age and among people and extremely zealous in traditions of my father's. But when God, who set me free apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. The immediate response was not uh, to consult any human beings. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were the apostles before I was, but I went to... Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that I am writing you, what, what I'm writing you is no lie. Then I went to Syria and Sicilia, and I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praise God because of me. So Paul 
is writing this letter, and we looked at last week. If you were here, if not, you can go online and check that out. Uh, the first ser- in our series, but we're laying the foundation. Paul was laying the foundation for the major point of his letter to the, the church at Galatia. Paul moved on past that, and he began to talk about some of his personal experiences. He went down and he was listing those, and then he also started trying to dispel some of those false accusations against him. So that's kind of a broad overview of of what he was saying in there. So let's look at it, and like I said, three different reasons why I think uh, the gospel is good news. First, Verses 11 and 12, I I, I think Christ brought the good news. There he said, but I make known to you, uh, emphasis, I'm telling you the truth. He said, later he said, I will have you to know. He's speaking a little confrontational. Remember last week, he uh, he, kind of dispelled with the Thanksgiving part of the letter. Most of the letters had a part of Thanksgiving. But he kind of pushed that aside and he got real kind of up in their face quickly. Did that again uh, here in the the second part uh, of the first chapter. The main point, the foundation of the gospel, it's not a human invention, but it was basically a, a divine intention. What is the gospel? What exactly is the gospel? You know, I think too many people um, simplify the gospel, make it too simplistic. But when I say that quickly, I think, you know, more often than not, probably more so, people complicate it too much. They want to add stuff to it or you have to do this and they make it this distant thing that we have no chance of ever attaining. And honestly, I believe that the gospel is simple. I believe that uh, the gospel is one word, Jesus. He came for me and you. And so I I think about in that time um, when a new king would, they would anoint a new king, they would send messengers out and those messenger would go from town to town announcing who the new king was. So in the same way, um, when Christ came, he came spreading the good news. The new king brought good news. Christ brought good news. And so many times we get caught up in all of the junk that we miss that main message. Christ brought good news. You know, and Paul said, he said, I didn't receive it from men. You know, think, think about Paul's uh, conversion experience. That's pretty drastic. Uh, not many of us can say that we were struck down and blind on that road to Damascus. God set apart Paul for an incredible work. And he received the gospel in an incredible way. He had an encounter with God on that road. So, and and that's the difference in a a lot of messages, a lot of false messages that are out there. Uh, They didn't come from God. And obviously Paul and his uh, testimony, it was from God. Oh, and second thing is that it wasn't taught by men. Now, here, here's the tricky part. Um, we should learn from other people, but that should not be our main source. The Holy Spirit is the one that changes us. He is the one that has the power to transform our lives, not other people. So... Again, Paul says uh, that he wasn't taught by men. The interpretation is from God. That's Second Peter um, chapter one verse twenty. That in, the interpretation, 
the gospel that he is sharing, that he is preaching is from God. You know, false teachers take and, and they change and they corrupt that message. And that's, that was rampant um, in this time and it's, isn't it also rampant today? But it's so easy to see that false, false gospel. You, you, you know um, a bank teller, how they uh, learn how to f find a counterfeit? Because they handle the real thing. They, they're given a stack of 20, $100 bills and they just go over, they feel it, they smell it, they just over and over and over and over until when one that's not right is in their hand, there's no question. That's the way it should be for us. If we are truly seeking God, looking into his word, ourselves, then when that false gospel comes along, when that false teaching comes along, we know, just like that bank teller knows. You can't hide um, a false gospel if you truly are in touch with the Lord. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> I heard it said that wrong is always wrong no matter how loud, how proud you believe it to be true. It doesn't matter. Wrong is wrong. You know, uh, Paul draws some personal parallels here. He, he's clarified that his message is from God. It, it, he's not claiming any unique message, but he's, he's claiming a unique reception of how he received this message. That life-changing experience on the Damascus Road. Uh, no foundation, origin of teaching. It was God. It, it was not man. You know, he, Paul, Paul also then talks about that he was not trained by the apostles. Um, imagine those apostles. And all of a sudden, Paul is being brought to them. And he wants to learn and be a part of them. Imagine their fear. This is the same person that was killing Christians, who was trying to stop this movement completely. And yet now you're going to welcome him. Well, how did that happen? The only way it happened was that someone stood beside Paul and took him. And that's Barnabas. Barnabas took Paul to those apostles and said, this, this, is, this is real. He's had a life-changing experience. We need, to, we need to help him. We need to listen to him. These are the same people that uh, he was trying to kill. He now is trying to be one of the leaders to lead them. We've got to, uh, we've got to be willing to to learn from faithful teachers, but our greatest teacher truly is the Holy Spirit. And we have to spend time with him daily if we're gonna be changed. You know, uh, it's kind of the same way as it was for Paul. We need other believers to help us and to teach us, even though we're holding on to the Holy Spirit in that relationship, but that's why, um, that's why I, send, I attended seminary. Uh, I'll be honest with you. I was not the best student. I tried to quit school in the seventh grade. My mom wouldn't let me. So she forced me to continue to go to middle school. And then, um, then I went to high school. And basically school was an inconvenience because of all the sports I was playing kind of got in the way and then I, I had been working in a warehouse unair conditioned warehouse as my job and I saw this picture on the wall that that's what I was going to do the rest of my life unless I 
continued my education. So God really called me to go to Clemson. I know that some people don't understand that, but he did. And I went to Clemson and I still worked in that warehouse because it was an awesome opportunity for me to make some money and, and to go to school. And I'd come home from Clemson and I'd go back and work at the warehouse. And all the people in the place would call me college boy. And I thought, well, if I can just get out of Clemson, then that'll be it. I mean, I struggled. I got out of middle school. I struggled. I got out of high school. I made it through Clemson. My mama was so happy. She thought, I never thought I'd get you through seventh grade and you graduated college. And lo and behold, God called me into ministry. And I went to seminary. And I literally made the best grades that I'd ever made in my life because of that calling that God placed on my life somewhere I wanted to be and I wanted to learn so much. We should learn from others. That's why we have connect groups here at First Baptist. We'd be able to learn together with another group of believers. Again, the Holy Spirit, though, is our greatest teacher. We, we all need mentors. Um, I have a friend. Um, he and I have been challenging each other spiritually probably for the last 15 years, talking on a daily basis about what God is speaking and telling us in our quiet times. A lot of times we're doing the same devotional material uh, so we can talk about it. But no one compares the Holy Spirit in a Christian's life. So that's the first thing. The second thing, uh, the gospel changes lives, verses 13 and 14. What's the evidence uh, uh, of Saul, Paul's divine transformation? You know, Paul's past was filled with religion, but no transformation. I mean, Paul was very educate, well-educated and lear learned in the Jewish tradition. But there had been no life change. He had persecuted the church and he tried to destroy it and stop it. That's kind of how sometimes people like to explain away the power of God. Have you ever noticed that? They give credit to a relationship or an event in their life as the reason why their life is on track when truly it's the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I have to tell you that my life, I already gave you a little snippet about school, but my life, I was not sold out to Christ like I should be either until a beautiful young Christian girl came into my life. And she wasn't the one who changed my life. It was the power of the Holy Spirit that changed my life and wanted me. But she helped me to see that there was power in the Holy Spirit and in God to help me make those changes and begin following God with all of my heart. Don't let folks explain away the power of the Holy Spirit. Transformation comes only from God's power. There's no other adequate explanation for Saul's conversion. Only God. Only God can stop you in your tracks on the Damascus Road. There's no other explanation. So he went to Jerusalem for 15 days and be with, to be with Peter. He had per, the ones that now that he had persecuted begin to glorify God for Paul. You know, Paul spoke about often about the campaign of the persecution, how he persecuted and how he arrested. He was honest. How he harassed Christians. He would talk about where he had come from and where God had taken him. Paul, um, he voted to have Christians executed on a regular basis. 
So Paul had this religious past, this awful persecuting present that led to this awesome transformation. He had violently persecuted the same people now that he was intending to lead. Only God could do something like that. You agree with me? So the third thing, the last thing, God is in control, verses 15 and 16. Now, I, I want you to think about, um, I want you to think about three things that uh, God is in control, um, about his sovereignty. God is in control of our, our physical life. Verse 15, who separated me from my mother's womb? You know, just like David, Jeremiah, Samuel, God set apart Paul at birth. Now, it took him a while to get to that point where he knew that God had set him apart. But he had set him apart. And while we may not be a king or a prophet, we have a purpose. 30-something years, I, I was a student minister, and my challenge to those students always came down to one thing. You have a job. Every single one of you have a job. You have a job to figure out what your purpose, God's purpose is for you. And then you need to cooperate with that and live it out to its fullest. That's it. And doesn't that seem too simple? But that's it. If every single one of us would find out what God's purpose is for us, cooperate with it, and live it out to the fullest, wow, what a world we would live in. What a church we would be. So how often do we disqualify people because of their lifestyle? You know, in, in student ministry, again, um, I... I I received a hard time a lot of the time for some of the people, some of the students we were reaching. Man, we would go away to camp and we would take people with us that they weren't Christians. They didn't know how to act like Christians. And those, some of those volunteers would say, Steve, I just can't believe that you're bringing these people. Where else should they be than exposed to the gospel of Christ? the power that, ha that can change their lives for eternity. So we can't look at someone and expect them to be a Christian when they're not a Christian. So the question uh, should never be, how acceptable do we find the lost? The, the lost are lost. We need to expose them to the power that can change them. Is God's powerful his power enough to change them yes we're equal, equally confused about the qualities um, to be used by God I hear so many times people just say well I, God can't do that because of where I've come from and just think about Saul Paul if God can take and he can use him, I think he can use you. I think he can take and use you in a, an incredible way that you can't even believe. You know, God is able. Don't insult God by saying he can't use you. He made a donkey talk, right? He made a Christian killer. <laughs> he made a Christian killer, a church planner. He wrote... Over half the New Testament, God can use you if you'll just let him. Second thing, God is in control of my spiritual direction, verse 15, and he called me through his grace. God's plan's not manufactured by us. We can't dream up, well, I want to do this for God. No, we don't even get a vote. He decides I remember walking up to my pastor 
And I said, man, I really feel like um, God's calling me into in ministry. And he just had this painful look on his face. He said, oh, Steve, if you can do anything else and be happy, do it. It can't be our plan. It has to be his plan. And when it's his plan, you can't stop it. We just got to get out of the way. We have to cooperate. We have to do whatever he calls us to do. God's purpose and plan is always the best. Let him lead. Yield to him. Let him work in you. Let Be used by God. You know, with, with Dallas coming, the greatest thing, uh, gift cards are awesome, and that's the old days, you know, in the old days, us old timers, they used to do a pounding where you would bring canned goods and food and stock their pant. We do gift cards now, and that's awesome and great, but you know the greatest thing you can give Dallas? Your support, your love, your prayers, your service, whatever he needs So third thing, God's in control of our eternal purpose. And we'll, we'll close with this. To reveal his son in me. Our calling and purpose are divine. Our ultimate purpose, a spoiler to you, Our ultimate purpose is exactly what God wants from us. He wants others to see Jesus in us. You know, one, we, we redid our vision and purpose uh, several, a couple years ago, but we kept one thing. And the one thing we kept was our statement to love and follow Jesus fully so others are drawn to him. And if we do that, if we love and follow Jesus fully, then they're going to see Jesus in us. And that's what he's calling us all to. Just to love him so much that that reflection of Jesus just overwhelms people. So this morning, um, my challenge to you is that right there? Are other people seeing Jesus in you? If they're not, I just challenge you, just draw closer to him. Spend more time with him in quiet time. Find others to hold you accountable. Holy Spirit can use other people in your life to draw you closer. And if you've never had the opportunity to accept Christ as your personal Lord and Savior or to be baptized as some were this morning, why not now? Why not as this, our new pastor, come, as Dallas comes? He'd love to baptize you his first Sunday here. How awesome would that be? So if you, any decision that God may be laying on your heart, um, I'm going to pray. The uh, band's going to come up to lead us. I'm going to have uh, Will stand, uh, stand on this side. I'll stand over here. If, you, if there's a decision God's laid on your heart, you just come. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your power. Your power that truly changes lives. Father, I thank you for that purpose that you have for each one of us. It's all unique and different, but God, it's there. You have a a vision and a purpose and a dream for us. I pray, God, we find out what that is and that we cooperate with it and we'd live it out to the fullest. Father, for those who might need to accept you for the very first time, I pray, Lord, that it's so simple. Just confess you as their Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray that they might uh, be challenged to do that. And for those that have never had the chance to be baptized, maybe, this morning, you placed it on their heart that they would just come and submit to that. Lord, we love you so much, and we thank you for the chance we've had to worship you. And now, Lord, we pray that we would just uh, come.
commit our lives even more deeply to you through this time, I pray in Jesus' name.